Okay. Good afternoon again. Thanks for joining everyone. Um, I have the agenda up here on this slide. Uh, we'll start with a, re, uh, a very brief recap of our June 2023 meeting highlights, and then we'll move into our um, standard technical team updates. And the special presentation topic for today is um, a discussion of the scope of our climate scenarios. And then we'll close with an update on the study schedule. Um, so we always like to start out with the study purpose slide um, because we do have new folks joining us every quarter. Um, so just a, a brief overview of the GLRI framework study. Um, this work is funded under the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative Action Plan 3 Focus Area 5, um, which is comprehensive science programs and projects. Um, we have an interagency team and we are working to identify the range of future Great Lakes water levels, wave heights, and ice conditions under a set of warming climate scenarios. Um, and we're using uh, proven models to advance our understanding of the Great Lakes conditions. And then also to complement the range of future conditions modeling output that we're developing, uh, we're also putting together planning and design checklists um, that are geared towards the use by stakeholders that are implementing Great Lakes coastal restoration projects. Um, and we hope that these checklists will be a resource um, to incorporate resilient and sustainable design into uh, their restoration work. Um, so to set the stage here, as we move into the recap of the June 2023 meeting, uh, I wanna go through a few definitions um, to make sure we're all starting from the same place uh, for, for our uh, technical, team, technical, technical team discussions. Um, so the first uh, term we have up here is historical meteorology. So when we refer to historical meteorology, we're talking about um, the unmodified atmospheric forcing data sets that are used by the models. When we talk about the bias corrected historical meteorology, um, these are the forcing data sets that have been modified by our team to address the biases um, that were identified during long run simulations um, in the historic data sets. And um, I'll go into that in a little more detail, but I um, just wanna cover that. And then as you can see here from the slide, the arrows, the bias corrected historical meteorology is the input data that is fed into the weather generator model simulations. Um, and so when we talk about the baseline simulation, simulation. Um, these are the scenarios that are run using the bias corrected historical meteorology data set. And then when we talk about the climate change scenarios, um, we're referring to the long series of daily weather output using that bias corrected historical meteorology um, that reflects the changes we are making to represent the warming climate scenarios um, and higher precipitation scenarios. And I'm going to put a link in the chat um, to our Chicago District YouTube page. Uh, we have all of our previous meetings recorded. So if you um, are interested, you can go back and review the previous presentations on the work that we've been doing to put together the baseline climate scenario simulation. So here we have our study model workflow. So on the, on the left-hand side, you'll see the, the model suite that we use to develop the static water level results. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, the workflow that we use to develop the wave and surge um, distributions. And so the numbers um, kind of correspond to the, the sub-teams uh, just to help yeah, cross-reference during the presentation. So the one you'll see is um, representative of the weather generator steps. Uh, the second is our lake levels and uh, more complex check models that we use to um, kind of evaluate how well our um, computationally efficient lake level models are doing. And then the third set is the wave and search models. And so just to kind of walk through here, turn on my laser pointer. On the left-hand side, you'll see the bias corrected historical meteorology is run through the weather generator to produce our baseline that then is fed through the lake level suite. And then similarly for the climate change scenarios, those are also fed through the weather generator, which is then passed through 
our suite of lake level models. And the lake level models produce our static water level results, so like our bathtub understanding of what the water levels are. And then the green models are our more computationally complex check models. So um, we use these, as I said, as you know, to check the reasonableness of our computationally efficient lake level models that are in the blue boxes. On the right hand side, we have our wave and surge suite. Um, and so they are taking um, historic ice coverage data set, um, historic storms, and um, a sample of the static water level results, and they will feed those through their uh, wave, wave and surge models, uh, SWAN and ADSERC, and we'll end up with our distribution of future waves and surge. And then through a statistical process, we'll be combining the static water levels with the wave and surge to ultimately come up with a distribution of total future lake levels under a range of climate scenarios. Um, so if you attended our June 2023 meeting, you'll remember that we um, talked pretty extensively about the bias correction process that the team went through um, to um, correct the historical meteorology forcing data. Um, and so um, let's see my notes here. So, it's, so I want to highlight, I'm going to show the results on the next slide, but I want to highlight before we flip to that, um, the, the importance of having a good baseline data set. Um, if you've been along with us um, throughout the study, you know that this has been a very challenging piece, but it was really essential for us to have a solid baseline we felt comfortable with because the climate scenarios are tweaks uh, from that baseline. So, so we needed to have a really solid starting place um, and we think that we have gotten there. And so um, this is a summary of the results that we presented last time um, and, and kind of where we are today with the baseline. Um, so the, the magenta box over here, this is a representation, uh, and this is an example, this is Lake Superior. We have these, these for all five Great Lakes, but we're just showing Lake Superior here as an example. Um, so the magenta box on the left, um, this is a box plot of the observed lake levels, um, you know, what, what we've actually seen in the historical record. The, this uh, purple box is a representation of the lake level that is produced by our static lake, lake level model suite. And this is the lake level that the team needed to replicate um, because this represents the, the best that our lake level models can achieve. So in other words, this was kind of the benchmark for what our um, you know, climate scenario, our uh, GLI framework models um, needed to replicate. And the two middle boxes show the result that we're achieving after the bias correction of the historical forcing data. And uh, we think we are as close as we can get to matching, matching this purple box. Um, there's still some bias, um, but it's very small and um, our team believes that it's negligible. And so, this, this is our baseline. We feel confident with this. Um, and we've also taken the additional step, um, as you can see here on the slide in the green and yellow boxes, um, we've taken the additional step to run test runs for a wet scenario and a test run of a dry scenario to make sure that the weather generator is producing results that are picked up through the lake level models. Um, and we, we've been successful. So this is really great news. Um, and today we're excited to share with you our um, proposed plan for the climate scenarios now that we've achieved the baseline. So now we'll move into our technical team updates. Um, and first is the update from the weather generator team. And I will do, introduce um, Dr. Sudarshana Makopati. Uh, Sudarshana, if you wanna come off mute. Yes. Um, so thank you, Kathleen. Um, Hello everyone, this is Sudarshana. I'm a postdoc working with uh, Scott Steinschneider. And uh, we also have John Kucheski on the call. He is also part of our weather generator team. So uh, I'll just give a, a broad overview on the uh, work that we have been doing on uh, our part. So we have completed the weather generator model calibration and validation using the bias-corrected historical meteorological data. 
uh, they, they already have defined this. Uh, and with the uh, annual cycles of weather regimes, we identified over the Great Lakes Basin. The baseline scenario is complete, and uh, we have shared the baseline files uh, for meteorological conditions over each sub basin over lake precipitation and the files for Ontario ice modeling uh, with the water level modeling group. We will test about 30 scenarios for future climate conditions. We have set up the codes to automate the model to generate those sc scenarios, but we'll talk about this later in the meeting. Um, currently, uh, we have started the final simulations. We have completed five scenarios of those climate simulations. Uh, that is our main ongoing work. Uh, so that is uh, the update we have so far uh, from weather generator team. So over to you, Kathy. Thank you. Thanks, Sirashana. And, and next, we'll move to the water level model update. Uh, and Dr. Lauren Fry and Zoe Miller were unable to be on the call today, but they've passed on their remarks to me. Um, so I will, I will go through those. And if there are any questions that I um, can't answer, I will coordinate with um, Dr. Fry and Zoe, and we will follow up with responses to those questions in our meeting follow-up materials. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this because um, it's largely uh, what I covered in the June 2023 meeting recap that I just went through, but uh, basically to summarize uh, the baseline scenario run for the upper lakes has been completed and the team is currently in the process of completing the baseline scenario run for Lake Ontario. Um, and this is because there's a few extra files um, that are specific to Lake Ontario. So it's just an additional step. Um, but Zoe um, has also been coordinating closely with Sudarshana on the model setup and file types to ensure compatibility between the weather generator and the lake level models as we prepare to initiate the climate change simulations. Um, and we'll go over those in, a, in more detail um, in the next section. And then I also want to show um, the results for the lakes that we've completed. Um, so Superior, Michigan, Huron, St. Clair, and Erie. And, um, you know, very similar to what I explained in the recap, uh, we feel like we are at a place where we do have a good representation of the lake levels. Um, so what you're looking at here, um, the, the purple on the far left, um, this is the observed historic lake level. The blue box plots are the water levels from our model suite. Um, and, you know, this is, uh, how well we're able to do with our models, basically as good as as good as the models can represent. So this was our benchmark. Um, and then the green and yellow boxes depict um, the the bias corrected for uh, baseline forcings. Um, and you can see we've done uh, the green is just kind of like a short run of the forcings and the yellow does represent the the long run. Um, so data from 1940 extending out into the future year of uh, 2999. Um, and so you can see even over that long run, well, while it's not 100% exact, it's very close and the difference we think is negligible. Um, and so uh, Zoe is just working on wrapping up um, these plots for Lake Ontario. Um, but yeah, we feel like we're in a good place. So I'm going to I'm going to pause um, to see if there are questions that I can answer. And if not, I will take those back to um, the the Glural and Detroit team. Um, oh, so, okay. I do see a a comment in the chat or a question in the chat. Um, so why was it concluded that there was bias in the historical weather data instead of bias in the lake level conceptual models? Um, and so I do have a note to myself here about that. Um, or if um, someone from Glural wants to come off mute, maybe you can answer uh, more quickly than I have, uh, than I can. And that that work was covered pretty extensively in our prior um, presentation. And so mm -hmm. um, Caitlin lists the link to our presentations. 
um, and in during them, um, we demonstrate diff we show different um, different forcings, um, cloud cover, and in in which just looking at the historic the historic um, observations that they they didn't match what what would be realistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I did find my note, apologies that it took me a second to flip back to a previous slide, um, but the, the team concluded, uh, you know, looking at the historical record and um, the methodologies for how data was collected over time, um, we think it comes down to just, you know, changes in the number of, um, you know, type and types of equipment that are out on the lakes um, collecting the data. Um, you know, we're looking back going all the way back to like, oh, I don't know if anyone 50? recalls. 1950. Yeah, 1950. Um, so yeah, just changes to uh, methodologies and, you know, sometimes equipment was offline. Um, over time, our data collection methods and uh, instruments have gotten better. Um, so that, that's what we attributed to it. Um, and um, yeah, if um, anyone from Glural wants to come off mute and elaborate further, um, you know, feel free. I think this is David Cannon at Sigler. Uh, I think that you pretty much covered it. There were some very obvious inconsistencies of the data. Like you mentioned the stations, there were periods of time where you would just have like a shift in the baseline mean that was very obviously not um, physical or, or real. And there was, I know, I think John mentioned a cloud cover. There was like a 50 year period of time where the cloud cover never dropped below 40%. <clears throat> which is pretty obviously incorrect so it, it was really we spent a lot of time kind of nitpicking over the the right way to bias correct but it, it was very apparent that there was an issue with the forcing data thanks for yeah thanks for that additional clarification and information okay I don't see any additional questions coming through the chat or hands raised. Um, so we'll move on and um, go through the, the update from the check model team. Um, so I will introduce Dr. David Cannon and Dr. Um, Joy Shin. Go ahead, uh, David. Yeah, no, thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> so um, our, our role in this whole project, as a reminder, is to, we are providing, these more computationally complex models that take a lot of computing power and a lot of time to run. So we're doing shorter runs of these models and more a, lim a more limited scope of these models in order to check the large lake thermodynamic model um, and the uh, large basin runoff model. So the, the main models that we're using to look at to being forced with the weather generator. So during the last quarter, we got a lot of work done. We completed our historical comparison of evaporation in ice using FVCOM sea ice and LLTM forced with the, the modified data set, the bias corrected data set. And we were able to quantify ice cover and monthly evaporation biases. I want to also point out, I think this is worth pointing out, that the, the biases were significantly reduced between the two models when we use the updated forcing data set. So in the previous model runs, large lake thermodynamic model essentially produced no ice cover whatsoever, and it now produces ice cover as well or better than FVCOM sea ice. Um, and as such, we also had mentioned before that we might modify the ice parameterization in LLTM, and we realized we don't need to now that we fixed the forcing data. We also finished a set of climate projections using FVCOM. So from 1979 to 2100, we have a full set of climate projections for the Great Lakes under three different SSPs, so SSP 1, 2, and 5. Um, and we conducted them using three different CMIP 6 models, so MIROC 6, ECR 3, and GFDL ESM 4. And then we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have ensembled the outputs to kind of minimize the biases and ice cover and surface temperature. Um, and we made sure that our scenarios were compatible with what the weather generator team is using. We also have worked on comparison of Wharf Hydro and LBRM over the historical period, so 2000 to 2020, which Joy is gonna talk about in a few minutes. And we've been working hard to identify future climate scenario forces for Wharf Hydro 
and finding an appropriate forcing data set to get climate scenarios for that. Um, an ongoing work, we are working on comparing LTM and SVCOM sea ice forced with CMIP6 models over the historical period. So that'll be more of our baseline once we're moving into the climate projection comparisons. And then uh, Joy is doing some extended comparisons of Wharf Hydro and LBRM over a longer time period, so 1940 to 2020. And then next steps, we are going to eventually be comparing our FDCOM CIS model with the LTM climate scenarios that Sudarshana is uh, finishing up. And then we'll be doing the same thing with Wharf Hydro. You can go on to the next slide. I just wanted to share briefly some of what we've been seeing with our future climate scenarios with FVCOM. So on the left, I'm showing annual average ice cover and on the right, annual maximum ice cover. And here, the each box plot, so they're kind of sectioned off into three sections. The first one is the historical period, which is 1980 to 2000, and then 2030 to 2050, and then 2080 to 2100. Thank you for helping show these off. Um, and then each color is a different climate scenario. So green is SSP1, which is the green pathway. Blue is kind of the business as usual. And red is the extreme, um, the extreme warming scenario with like increased emissions. And <clears throat> the, the main thing I wanted to point out is that under every scenario and for, I'm showing three lakes here, but for all five lakes, we see really extreme uh, loss in ice cover. So it's over 50% from the, the historical baseline um, to mid-century. And by end century, under the most extreme scenario, we actually see zero ice cover, both on average, both like in the maxima, but also uh, average. So that means that we, we would really expect under these scenarios and, and with these model results that we'll see very little ice in the future on the Great Lakes. Um, and even if we take the green pathway, then we will still see significant reductions, although it will not disappear completely. And then I'm, I'm going to pass it off to Joy to talk about uh, kind of her results right now. Thanks, Davey. Uh, this is a tech model updates for Wolf Hydro historical simulations. And the historical simulations were conducted for recent 20 years using Wolf Hydro and LBLM across the entire Great Lakes regions. So the simulated and observed flows were compared together. Um, this plot shows the annual average flows for each lake basin. The observed and simulated flows were aggregated for each lake basin to see the overall trend. So in each plot, the blue and orange colors showed the simulated flows using Wolf Hydro and LBRM, and the red color showed the observed flows. Uh, Overall, we can see that the both models were consistent with observed flows, and LBLM slightly overestimated flow while the Wolf Hydro underestimated it. Um, I'm currently working on uh, expanding these historical simulations from 1940 to 2020 to investigate how these two models respond to long-term changes at annual and seasonal scales. So, also, I'm working on the future simulations. The, so I'm considering the same planning forcing scenarios uh, used in FECOM size will be incorporated into the Wolf Hydro simulations. Yeah. Uh, that's all for now. Yeah. Um, thanks, Joy. Uh, there, there's a comment uh, or, a, or a, sorry, excuse me, a question. Um, Joy, what does flow what does flow mean uh, when you talk about average annual flow? Oh, that is the stream flow um, observed at the ET stations um, and also simulated at the locations of the cases. So I compared the, I, I made it the aggregated for the only observed stations the, uh, for the ET lake basins and aggregated, aggregated to the ET, ET lake basins to compare the, uh, compare the simulated and observed one together. So this is not the total uh, run of discharges in each lake basin. Okay, Th thanks, Joy. Um, I'm gonna pause. Uh, those were really interesting results, David and Joy. Thank you for covering that. Um, are there any questions, any additional questions? Um, I'll wait to see if we get any in the chat or any hands raised.
Okay. I'm not seeing any additional questions come through the chat or hands popping up. Okay. Well, th thank you, David and Joy. Okay. Um, so now we're going to move into, uh, now that we've heard from the weather generator team, the lake level team, and the check models, um, we're going to transition to a discussion of the scope of our climate scenarios. Um, and this will be new material that we haven't um, covered with you all before. Um, so yeah, we're really, really excited to share this update. And I am going to um, pass it back over to uh, Sudarshana. Hi, thank you, Kathleen. So uh, we are going to use IPCC CMIP models, specifically CMIP 6 model for our project. So the purpose of uh, CMIP is to provide climate scenarios uh, uh, for science, climate scientists with a database of coupled GCM simulations under standardized boundary conditions. These model outputs can be uh, used to assess uh, climate warming's impact uh, on atmospheric and hydrological processes. So uh, we'll move on to the next slide. Please. Um, So to study the impacts of climate change on hydrometeorological conditions over the Great Lakes, we first started uh, with the uh, existing uh, study, uh, existing literature. So the first uh, figure on the right, the top uh, right one, uh, that shows uh, the changes in atmospheric water cycle uh, from the uh, CMIP-6 models. Overall, uh, when we come to look at the uh, recent studies, both using CMIP-6 and uh, CMIP-5 simulations, we see that some uh, clear patterns are emerging. So, first of all, we can expect about 2 degrees warming uh, by mid-century and about 5 degrees warming uh, at the end of the century under worst case scenario, that is, RCP 8.5, uh, when I'll talk about in detail our work that will correspond to SSP uh, 5 to 8.5. Um, so under uh, worst case scenario, we are uh, going to expect that at most five degrees of warming uh, at the end of the century. And uh, both mean annual temperature, both mean annual precipitation uh, overall precipitation and the extreme precipitation are going to increase. And uh, most importantly, there, I hear, there may be some shifts in the seasonality of the precipitation cycle, uh, with summers getting drier and winter and springs getting wetter. This is uh, something that's been uh, found in almost all models. So, as I mentioned that uh, for our project, we are going to use uh, CMIP-6 products, specifically a downscaled version of CMIP-6 outputs. Uh, the figure on the right uh, bottom here is from this study. Uh, we are going to use a LOCA downscaled uh, product of CMIP-6. LOCA is a statistical downscaling method developed by uh, the scientist at uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and it's widely used and uh, at a, and the products are at a very high resolution. So we have daily time series of precipitation temperature, uh, mean and maximum temperature from 1950 to 2100 at six kilometer resolution. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so, uh, uh, but to use the GCMs, whether downscaled or not, uh, we always face with some challenges. So, first of all, lakes are not well represented in those GCMs. So, uh, even we are using uh, the local uh, downscaled product, a finer resolution product, they don't uh, have the uh, they don't have any grades over the lakes. So, all the products that we have are for the grids over land. So that will uh, inform the LBRM forcings, but we still uh, have to uh, find uh, 
uh, find some GCM output for LLTM forcings. But for LLTM forcings, uh, for wind speed and cloud cover, there is no good evidence uh, of changes in these variables uh, from the GCMs itself. And uh, that's why we decided that we'll uh, assume that they remain same as the historical values. So overall, we have uh, mean precipitation, extreme precipitation, and minimum and maximum temperature, and potentially relative humidity. So five factors of change to generate a possible future climate scenarios. The so next one, please. Um, from the local downscale CNF6, we got the GCM ensemble average and compared the long-term uh, means with baseline historical period. So in this plot, I'm showing the long-term average precipitation change with respect to baseline from 1981 to 2013. Uh, the green lines show the spread uh, of the precipitation change across individual GCMs, the top and bottom green squiggly lines. And in the middle, we have these orange lines. They are the uh, average generated across uh, emission scenarios. So for long-term average precipitation, we found that there can be two to 13% increase by the end of the century. Next one, please. Uh, similarly, we uh, analyze the daily maximum uh, and minimum temperature values for uh, changes. And uh, uh, next one will be more useful uh, the next in the next slide we basically summarize uh, the plots that i just have shown so here we calculated decade wise changes in mean precipitation and minimum and maximum temperature uh, for grids over sub basins from the fine resolution local downscale products that we are using and these changes will then inform us uh, the range of climate perturbations that we can incorporate in weather generator model uh, that are consistent with CNIP6 projections and developed uh, and develop the future climate scenario runs. So, um, the next one. Um, so next we'll look at the seasonality of changing. This is a very interesting uh, from our modeling perspective because this is a new development over the existing weather generator model also. So as I mentioned that summers are uh, getting drier and uh, spring and winter are projected to get wetter. And uh, in the bottom uh, plot, that's what we are showing for one scenario uh, and across the models, the uh, line colors are representative of different GCMs and we are showing it for SSP 5 to 8.5, that is the worst case scenario. Um, so as we can see, we uh, have a clear signal of the seasonal uh, changes in precipitation, but we didn't find this uh, clear signal of seasonality change in the temperature. Next, we looked at the relative humidity in the next slide. Um, so the relative humidity will influence the dew point temperature, uh, which will then uh, become a forcing in the LLTM. But uh, these are uh, the, uh, so in the local downscale products, we do not have the relative humidity time series for future projection. So we went back to the original GCMs, uh, the course resolution GCMs, and we checked the literature and we found that some GCM models that have uh, grids over lake and some reliable, some reliable lake representation, we selected those GCMs and we checked uh, whether there is a uh, trend in the changes in relative humidity. We found that at some uh, lakes, there is a uh, small decline. Here we are showing the results for Lake Superior, but uh, there is not much change in all the lakes that we have seen. And uh, 
we decided that these small decline at some uh, grades over the lakes will not be very much impactful for our study. So we decided that we'll keep the dew point temperature time series as their historical values. So um, from this exercise, we came up with uh, about 30 -ish possible future climate scenarios. Um, I know this slide looks busy, but I'll try to uh, give an overview of the work plan here. The grid here shows the possible scenario, each marker either black or green. So, and each axis have uh, one variable level of changes or one variable. So we found that min both minimum and maximum temperature changes uh, uh, have different rate of change, but we saw that the, uh, there is a clear concurrent level of change. So at, uh, we can identify a certain level of change for minimum and maximum temperature that occur together. And so we club them together on the left axis of the grid. The blue axis on the bottom is the is for changes in mean precipitation. And black markers on the grid show uh, with the cases where we have seasonality change uh, in the way uh, precipitation. And we'll also check few cases where we are not changing the seasonality of the precipitation, only changing the mean. Um, for extreme precipitation, the sub daily scale extreme pre precipitation, particularly, uh, there will be a scaling factor. Uh, so we uh, decided that we'll uh, pick either 0% zero zero change per degree Celsius of warming or 7% uh, change per degree Celsius of warming, but 7% uh, is a theoretical value and uh, we still have to decide whether uh, this will be either 0 or 7 or a value in between. We are processing the data to, uh, processing the daily downscale data to understand what will be a a realistic representation of the scaling factor, but uh, that is uh, something we are uh, doing right now. Uh, but overall, we found that uh, if we consider these 27 to 30 uh, scenarios, that will be consistent with the climate projections uh, from CMIP 6, uh, uh, CMIP 6 outputs. So uh, that's where we are right now. And uh, if you uh, point uh, towards the zero, uh, the box where the zero degree of uh, mean precipitation changes, this is basically the uh, baseline run. So where we have zero temperature and uh, minimum and maximum temperature change and zero precipitation change, that represents the baseline. We have started working on uh, the four scenarios just above the baseline runs. So we are moving uh, uh, upwards from zero to uh, four levels of temperature change and running the weather generator for these uh, four scenarios on this axis, the zero uh, temperature, zero precipitation change axis. Uh, Caitlin, if you can follow the, uh, if you can point the uh, mouse here that will be helpful. So uh, from zero, if you just go up these four levels, so here we are at this along that axis. So this will give us uh, a, a possible range of uh, changes when we only have these uh, temperature uh, warmings and we are not uh, including the uh, precipitation scaling or precipitation changes right now for these uh, initial runs. And we are basically setting up the weather generator model uh, for these first four initial runs uh, so that we get a sense of the ranges of change uh, in the water levels uh, that will happen from these uh, warming temperature conditions. So once we finalize them, we'll automate the 
weather generator and uh, generate thousand year simulation for each of these climate scenarios. So that is where we are at and we are doing this for LBRM and LLTM forcing as well as the Lake Ontario ice modeling forcing. Mm -hmm. So over to you. Thank you. Yeah, Sudarshana, thank you so much for that overview of um, your literature review and um, the, the proposed plan for your modeling efforts. Um, I, I'm going to pause at this point to see if there are any questions. Um, I know that was a lot of material. Okay. Not seeing any questions come through the chat or hands raised. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. Um, so so we wanted to add an additional word about the the scope of our future scenarios. Um, so you've just heard Sudarshana talk um, a lot about changes in temperature and precipitation. Um, and not so much about like changes in storms, and we get that question a lot. Um, so, so we wanted to, to spend a few minutes talking about that. Uh, so we are in the GLRA framework study um, only looking at changes in, in, pre in temperature and precipitation. Um, we're not looking at changes in storm tracks or types. Um, you know, we are assuming that the storms are going to stay the same, but they will occur with these varying static lake levels in the future that could be higher or lower. Um, and then also the varying ice conditions, but the storms themselves, we were not um, making any um, guesses or assumptions about how they may change in direction, um, you know, probability of occurrence or size. Um, and uh, basically the fundamental reasons for that decision come down to the current state of the science regarding Great Lakes storm types and um, also our model limitations. Um, and so we're going to spend a few minutes unpacking that a little bit more and then I'll pause again for time for questions if, if there are any. Um, and I think that Margaret had to drop um, because she had um, a conflict this afternoon. Um, but but the wave and surge team um, from Erdic put together this slide, and I will attempt to to summarize it. Um, so they've pulled together here some um, quotations from the literature about global climate models and storms. Um, and essentially, the global climate models right now are uh, too coarse to accurately capture storm events. Um, so you can see here they've pulled some. Um, information from the literature about tropical storms and cyclones um, and tropical cyclones right now are not well resolved um, and the types of storms that we see on the Great Lakes like thunderstorms are even smaller than tropical cyclones so um, we just face some challenges uh, with the the models themselves in resolving storm events um, so it's just hard for us to um, capture the appropriate level of information that would be required to um, to try to determine how yeah how storms function in these models into the future. And then I'm going to move on um, this one, um, Sudarshana or or John, if you want to speak speak to these next two slides. Yeah, I can I can cover them. Um... Yeah, so as we, as so Sudarshana just presented, and then Caitlin was also remarking on, um, we're using the weather generator here because it allows us to sort of better, maybe more fully sample the range of uncertainty that we have in some of the climate conditions that we care about. So we're able to look at changes in minimum per, uh, temperatures, maximum temperatures, uh, precipitation, seasonality of precipitation, lots of different variables that um, impact the Great Lakes and the water levels in the Great Lakes. Um, so, um, yeah, we're really focusing on what we might, uh, refer to as, um, first order. And these are all sort of thermodynamic changes, um, that we're looking at, um, which are, um, all associated with a Sudarshana walkthrough, 
some basic level of agreement um, in the GCMs. So we've really sort of focused our analysis in that particular place. Um, just to put the bottom line up front in terms of the storm characteristics, uh, these are not like what we would maybe talk about as sort of first order impacts associated with climate change. And um, one of the things that goes along with that is, is we might not sort of characterize the debate about how these things would change uh, with sort of like some level of agreement. In, in fact, we might like sort of think about this more as like a, an, an open and uh, broad area of um, like sort of active disagreement um, uh, between the models and um, uh, climate science. Um, so um, all of that uh, being said, uh, the weather generator is, it's not the best possible tool for us to look at changes in storm characters, uh, storm characteristics, um, which would include things like changes in storm tracks and intensities. Um, it's, that's not to say that it'd be impossible to model these things using the weather generator. Uh, we could do those things. Um, and so we, we've thought a little bit about, you know, how we might sort of carefully resample uh, historic events and maybe make, you know, specific perturbations to those events. Um, but it, it wouldn't may maybe be the best and most logical use of the weather generator or way to even sort of uh, model some of these types of changes. Um, so a highly resolved uh, physical climate model over the Great Lakes would probably be a better tool, something connected to, to GCMs as well. So. Um, something more like the wharf hydro models um, or, or wharf models in general that we've we've talked about uh, previously. Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide, please, Caitlin. Um, yeah, and this gets back to sort of my uh, what I said is sort of my bottom line up front, I guess. Um, with respect to this, there's a, just a general lack of consensus as to what some of the changes in future storm frequency and tracks might be. Um, uh, over North America, but uh, more specifically over the Great Lakes. Um, and so you can see a couple of uh, uh, figures from a couple of papers in this area that um, that sort of show uh, uh, this. Uh, so the, the figure on the left, which you're seeing is changes in the frequency of extratropical cyclones. Um, and if you look across the those uh, different uh, climate scenarios, which are on the X axis. Those are the, some of the same climate scenarios we've talked about in other parts of the presentation today, uh, all the way from 8.5 at the, the purple one, which is sort of the um, business as usual or worst case scenario, all the way down to uh, the red one, which is sort of like a, a very uh, substantial and, and um, sustained decrease in, in global emissions. You don't see like sort of an obvious trend um in in the way that these uh the frequency of these extra tropical cyclones would be expected to to change um which would be maybe a, a necessary first step in in order for us to make some sort of logical set of perturbations uh to to these things over the top of the great lakes um yeah and, and more generally like we can see um just some level of uh, both bias and disagreement in the gcms in terms of um the 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 pressures and and things like that that sort of drive the track of these storms and and also some of these characteristics like their wind speeds and and those sorts of things. So um, I think that's all I have on these two slides. So I'll turn it back over to you, Caitlin. Thanks, John. And then our final slide. Um, I will pass it over to Dr. Abby Hudson from University of Michigan Siegler um, to talk about. Um, some exciting work that she is currently involved in. So, Abby, I will open it up to you. Thanks, Caitlin. <clears throat> yeah, we, uh, while there is definitely no major consensus over what mid latitude cyclones are going to do in the Northern Hemisphere in our future models, uh, we have done some work in the historical trends of extratropical cyclones that pass through the Great Lakes region. Um, simply using the ERA-5 re, uh, global real analysis data from the past 60 years, we were um, we used an algorithm to track cold seat, so cold season only cyclones over the Great Lakes. Um, the research that we did, we I, were able to identify 886 cyclones. And um, just to explain the figure on the right, what uh, you'll see two trend lines, those are from what we call short track or or and long track cyclones, where short track is a cyclone that only tracked for as uh, for less than two thousand kilometers across uh, the nation, and long track is for greater than two thousand kilometers. And really, the only difference between the two is you know short track they don't get um, as as 
extreme or they don't have as much precipitation as the long track cyclones. And that's just um, to elaborate why we have two lines on the figure on the right. So um, once we tracked these cyclones in the reanalysis for the past 60 years, uh, we created yearly composites and um, evaluated the trends that we see historically. Um, we do see that the cyclones themselves that interact with the Great Lakes are getting warmer and wetter. Um, and that's just to be, that will be reflected in the overall climate change that we're um, implementing in like the weather generator, right? Like the daily temperature max and daily temperature min will reflect these cyclone passages and their temperatures associated with it. But um, really we are seeing no significant trend in uh, cyclone strength, the number of storms or the wind, seat, wind speed we see in these storms. So finally to explain the figure on the right, the top panel, we see um, this plotted here is minimum mean sea level, perturba mean sea level pressure perturbation uh, in these cyclones that pass through the Great Lakes. Um, the uh, variable lines are ones, you know, is every year. And then the um, straight lines are a simple uh, linear regression. And um, as you can see, there's, there's no statistically significant trend in either the short track or long track storms in terms of uh, pressure perturbations. Uh, the number of storms as well do not show any significant trend what, whatsoever. So we're still seeing the amount, the same amount of storms seasonally in these cold seasons that we had 60 years ago, I mean, overall. Um, and then finally, for mean wind speed on the bottom plot, um, again, we really don't see any statistically significant trends saying that these storms are getting stronger or bringing with them any higher wind speeds. And this is, all, again, all through historical analysis, but um, uh, unlike temperature and moisture, we're not seeing any significant significant trend. And um, yeah, uh, we're, we've submitted this, this research for publication and um, yeah, I, I'm glad we could be of help to answer this question. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Um, so I'm going to pause here. Um, we're at the end of our section um, to see if there are questions um, coming through the chat. Um, and I do see um, a question. Is there any trend in latitude of ETCs? Um, and that would be extra tropical storms. Um, so Abby, I don't know if you investigated that. Okay. Yeah, we, we looked at it and we are seeing evidence that storm tracks are possibly shifting northward. We do, um, didn't gain any, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Error estimation or statistical significance. We don't have those statistics on that yet. Um, but like I said, it is possible that these, these storms are shifting slightly northward um, in, the, in the Great Lakes region. Thanks. See, I'm just going to pause to see if we have any additional hands raised or questions. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, so Taking back up with our technical team updates, but moving on to the other side of our model workflow. Um, I'll walk through uh, our update from the Erdic Wave and Surge modeling team. Um, so as I mentioned, Margaret Owens B um, had, to, had to drop off from this call um, at 2.30. So I'm gonna deliver their update on behalf of the Erdic team. Um, so we put together this chart. It, it looks a little bit different than what you've seen in the past, but we thought it was um, hopefully easier to understand kind of the progression of work here from this team. Um, so you can see that um, they have made uh, significant progress on Lake Ontario. Um, so we've made it through the, the storm selection and um, validation calibration report process. Um, it has also undergone an agency technical review um, so, it, so a youth states agency technical review is um, a panel of reviewers that are 
internal to the agency, but um, not involved with the team. So it's kind of like an outside um, check on the work. And they have um, completed the model setup and baseline model runs for Ontario. And then for Superior, um, you can see similarly making progress. Um, the validation and calibration report um, has been drafted and we're currently in the review process. Um, and we are looking to finalize that review uh, later, uh, or sorry, excuse me, not later this month, in uh, mid-October. And then with the Michigan Huron progress, um, the DEM has been completed, which is kind of the, the mesh that covers the whole lake. Um, that's kind of the basis for the modeling. And um, ultimately, that's how the save points will be identified. Um, they've completed the storm selection for Michigan Huron, and then um, this is the next lake that they will begin work on the calibration and validation. And then um, Lake Superior, St. Clair is our, is our last lake. Um, so that is um, that to be complete, or yeah, work will be underway um, later this year for Erie and St. Clair. Um, and if you'll remember back you know, what we talk about during our meetings, um, we're spinning these out on a lake by lake basis um, to, yeah, for, you know, computational reasons. And also um, we're using the best available Jabble text data. So as the new products are being released, um, that's what the team is using. Um, and so that's kind of the reason for the sequencing here. And I just checked my notes, but I think that was all they wanted me to highlight. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing anything additional. So I'll pause and see if there are any questions for, for the Wave and Surge team um, that I can field. Um, I see a question here from Rob. If you will be considering possible changes to wave height and period. Um, Rob, I think I'm going to have to follow up with that and we will include a response to your question in our meeting notes because um, I don't see anyone on from Erdic and I'm not qualified to provide that answer. Um, so I, we will we'll follow up with that and um, circulate it with the meeting notes um, to everyone on our email list. Oh, thanks, Rob. Thanks for understanding. Okay. Um, and now I will um, pass it over to our USGS colleagues and um, introduce Dr. Eric Kalentz to talk about the coastal change likelihood. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for attending on this um, Thursday of swirl and um, exciting things happening um, across our government. Um, it is, uh, it, so we wanted to provide um, an update on uh, the coastal change likelihood outcomes. So these are um, really the the outcomes that are going to assess the impacts of all of these modeling changes on the landscape itself, on the coastal or lakeshore landscape itself. Um, again, uh, to remind everyone, this is part of, um, we're moving um, what a strategy that we piloted for the Northeast region over to the Great Lakes. So this is our next great regional um, expanse. We've got a fantastic team working on this. Um, and for those that are curious about um, learning more about this, uh, you can either use the QR code or uh, the URL that's provided on this slide to learn more about what we did in the Northeast. Um, so you can kind of get a better sense for how this, this is transferring to the Great Lakes. But we had some preliminary results that we wanted to share with you um, today. Um, so the coastal change likelihood is comprised of three um, components. There's, um, there's this uh, first component, which is looking at the fabric, and it's really looking at the composition of the landscape and, and its integrity or resistance um, to change. Um, so uh, we are squarely in this phase right now, and those are the re results we'll, we'll be sharing with you today. Um, 
the second piece is really a hazards assessment um, and looking at the hazards that are operating on that landscape. This will be a synthesis of a lot of the modeling results that you've seen and that have been covered in this meeting um, already. And so that's kind of the piece that we're waiting on others in the team for um, so that we can then add that with the fabric and come up with this coastal change likelihood or CCL outcomes components. Um, to assess where change is most likely and which hazards um, are likely to drive that change. So, um, Caitlin, if you want to move on to the next slide. Uh, this slide just outlines um, the decision tree approach that we're using um, to comprise this, this fabric, uh, fabric component for the lakes. So we're showing an example from Ontario um, where the debate is um, determined from a, a combination of topographic and bathymetric data, very high resolution DEM that Army Corps provides, um, in addition to uh, what uh, uh, um, land, uh, high resolution land cover um, information as well. And that comes from um, NOAA. And you can see we've got this, this tree displayed in kind of a cool to warm color. Um, array. So the cooler indicating um, higher resistance to change. So, so these are harder um, shorelines, rockier um, shorelines, areas where there might be structures um, versus, you know, sandier, more unconsolidated, uh, unconsolidated um, shores in the um, orange uh, oranges. Um, and then you can see that we continue to add levels to this tree beyond the land cover and beyond that domain level um, of, you know, that's really determined by a combination of elevation and slope um, and bluff height um, and looking at uh, more nuanced information such as which shorelines are hardened, um, what can we uh, learn about surficial geology. Um, so that's a data set from USGS, hardened shorelines come from um, NOAA, NOAA data set as well. Um, and then there's uh, a wetland health assessment component that factors in, as well as uh, more historical shoreline change information. Um, the late, later to our information that we're getting from Central Michigan and um, Michigan Tech. So um, next slide, please, Caitlin, because this is the exciting part. So we've we've completed the Ontario fabric build. Um, and Ontario was great because it had really great data to work with um, that really ticked all the boxes out of the gates. And so we've got a really nice visual display of just, again, that first phase, what the fabric looks like, what the integrity of that landscape looks like um, out of the gates. Um, and from this, we'll layer on um, hazards acting on it and then look at that change um, over the next decade, the likelihood of change over the next uh, decade. So again, warmer colors, uh, areas where change would be more likely, um, yellows and um, greens, um, areas where change is um, a little less likely or more resistant to change. Um, so we'll be sharing results um, from the other lakes as we move forward, but um, we just, um, we were excited with, uh, you know, the build from Ontario and wanted to share those results. Thanks, Erica. Sure. I will pause at this point um, to see if we have questions for Erica. Okay. Not seeing any hands or chats. Um, Erica, thanks so much for, for staying on My and pleasure. sharing your work with us. Okay, moving on to our final agenda item, which is our study schedule update. Um, so you can see here with the yellow arrow um, indicating you know, where we're currently at within the study timeline. Um, we are um, you know, getting ready to really get going, well, yeah, really um, finalize the, clim the future climate scenario runs, um, as you heard. And um, the weather generator team is hard at work. And then once they're done, they will be, you know, passing their results to the lake level team to run through the lake levels. Um, so we're very excited um, and we'll, we'll have um, a lot going on this fall into early winter. And then moving into the, the wave and surge team, um, you can see kind of the reflection of the table that I showed um, the 
the staggered release of our of our wave and surge um, analysis. So it will be Lake Ontario, Lake Superior, and then uh, Michigan and Huron will be completing at the same time. And then finally, um, Lake Erie will be the last lake that we tackle with the wave and surge analysis. Um, and then um, later on in the study, we'll be completing our demonstration vulnerability assessment. So taking the results of our um, future lake levels and wave and surge um, and applying those to um, two sites that we'll be working to select with EPA um, to do a qualitative risk assessment um, and kind of provide a demonstration on how um, we, we think these results can be used. Um, to inform uh, re coastal restoration and uh, resiliency. And um, and then, yeah, also, um, we didn't really cover it in great de detail during today's meeting, but um, of course, the coastal hazard system we've covered in previous meetings. Um, the coastal hazard system is um, an existing web platform that is run um, by the USACE ERDIC, and it hosts uh, coastal storm hazard data and so that's where the results of this work will also uh, will also live, um, and so that's that's built into our schedule here. Um, and you can see that the little green boxes say CHS. Um, so just wanted to highlight that note because I don't think I covered it earlier in the presentation. And with that, um, we will will close up this afternoon. Um, I will pause one final time to see if there are any closing questions or hands um, or or comments from the team. Um, and while I'm waiting for that final check, um, I will just put in a plug. Uh, our next meeting is uh, scheduled for December 28th. Um, we recognize that that's not a great time of the year uh, for folks. And so uh, what we did last year was um, rather than host a live meeting, um, we provided a a written uh, summary and update. And so that's what we're planning on doing this time around. So um, I'll keep the calendar invite for now, uh, but more information will follow in December about that, uh, about our next progress um, update. And I'm not seeing anything else in the chat or hands raised. So um, thank you so much for your time and attention this afternoon. And um, we will look forward to providing you another update in December. Um, take care everyone, thank you.